Welcome to the Jonathan Kenlock Show. You cannot have Mike Duggan in your studio and not have a conversation with him about the current and future state of politics here in Metro Detroit. When we come back, we'll talk to Mike Duggan on the other side. comes to politics and the relationships that are just all intertwined with the financial um, devastation that is hitting many communities. And there is one individual who is familiar with all of these relationships and all of these various different challenges that local communities are having. And that individual is Mike Duggan. And I'm glad to have you here in the studio. Well, thanks for having me, Jonathan. Well, we, we of course talked uh, the, the last week about DMC and your um, impact over at DMC. But we cannot have you here and not talk about all of the things that are going on in Wayne County, Detroit, and Lansing. When you were over at um, Wayne County, um, as you mentioned last week, and you all first came in, there was a deficit there. Right. You got it out of the deficit. Somehow, we're hearing that there are some legacy, um, legacy debt, there's some legacy debt that exists because of pension, um, pension deals that were give, given out at, that over time. And what I wanted to do on that question was ask, was part of that, those issues that are, that are being talked about right now regarding the pension problems over at Wayne County, was that a problem that began under your tenure? No, it didn't. In fact, it was the Lucas administration back in 84 that really fixed the pension problem in Wayne County. Uh, Lucas took away from all employees, and I was a county employee at the time. I was an assistant corporation counsel uh, when he did it. They took away the guaranteed retirement, the 2% a year, and put us in a so-called defined contribution plan. Uh, and that meant you didn't have the legacy costs. Whatever was in your plan, you took with you. That plan stayed that way throughout the entire 16 years of the McNamara administration. When we left office, the pension fund was fully funded. There was money in the rainy day fund, and we'd had 15 straight balanced budgets. Now, in 2008, the county reversed direction and put in the defined benefit plan. And, and now the time, of course, was terrible because right after they did it, the stock market crash and they ended up in a, in a huge hole. Uh, but through the Lucas administration and the McNamara administration, there were none of those kinds of pension programs. What was interesting last week was when you said how when the McNamara administration took office that there was a partnership between Lansing and Wayne County to address the deficit that you all were faced with. Part of that address was revenue, revenue coming in. and. As you can see right now, Wayne County has a hundred million dollar deficit. The city of Detroit has had a hundred and some odd million dollar deficit, and I think it's roughly now roughly now remains around forty something million dollars. You have um, the city of Detroit under a consent agreement, and there is no talk, no talk about revenue being part of um, addressing some of these challenges that the city of Detroit and Wayne County, I'm talking about revenue, new revenue coming out of Lansing. Right. And so if you look at what we did, a significant part of Wayne County's problem was a problem the legislature created. The legislature passed a law that said counties had to pay all hospital bills for all uninsured at whatever rate hospitals wanted to charge. And it ran up a huge deficit that the Lucas administration left for us. We did a couple of things. One is we came into Wayne County and cut our costs. The second thing was we showed Lansing that if we could put these uninsured into an HMO and let them see a doctor early, the cost would go down. And the third piece was Lansing needed to pay their share of the cost overruns. And Lansing bought that. Interestingly, Governor Blanchett was there, but the Senate was run by Senate Majority Leader John Engler. And so we had a negotiated deal that was acceptable to Engler, 
and Blanchard both. And we came up with a deal that was a combination of cost cutting at the county level and a four cent statewide cigarette tax at the state level that left Wayne County with 15 straight balanced budgets. Uh, but it was hard work. Ed McNamara went up and down those hallways for six or eight weeks showing outstate Republican legislators we were managing responsibly. And once you show legislators that, they're willing to trust you with a buck. Well, that, that was you all showing the legislature that you all are able to manage the, the, the resources. Right now, under this consent agreement, the state is in here. The state has a layer of government that is here in the city of Detroit, the Financial Advisory Board. So they're part of, this, part of the framework as far as city operations. Why isn't there, why isn't there, as far as you, for, based on your, your, um, your knowledge, why isn't there any real discussions taking place about revenues um, being brought into the city, especially when you have the state actually at the table. The question is, who's bringing forward the plan to Lansing, and are you convincing Lansing you're running the city well? The Financial Advisory Board isn't the only lack of self-determination in the city. You know, the Water Department is not run by the city of Detroit. It's been run by a federal judge for 30 years. The Police Department has been under uh, a U.S. Attorney or Justice Department monitoring for civil rights violations for more than 10 years. And now uh, the finances are under the State Financial Advisory Board. There is a history of Detroit losing its right to self-determination through poor management. And what we have got to do is run the city competently and balance the budget. And so you see people complain that there's not enough police responding to the crime rates up, we don't have enough money. We've had four police chiefs in four years. That has nothing to do with money. Uh, that has to do uh, with a management problem. And what you have got to be able to show Lansing is that you have a sound management plan, and then I think you have a basis uh, for going up there, particularly in light of the fact uh, that the state reneged on its commitment uh, on revenue sharing. Uh, but I'm convinced that if we put together a sound plan that said, here's how we're going to be balanced, here's the service we're going to deliver, but here's the revenue we need, and you ought to make good on your moral obligation, I think it is possible to put together a proposal like that. Well, when we come back, we're going to have a conversation about next year. Next year, you have the election where the mayor of the city of Detroit, along with the city council, and a newly formed elected police commission will be on the ballot. Mike Duggan is saying he wants to potentially be on that ballot. So when we come back, we're going to talk to him about his plans for Detroit's future. Welcome back to the Jonathan Kinlock Show. Mike, you've been away from politics for the past nine years. Based on the political landscape here in the city of Detroit, what makes you think that you are a, the right fit to lead the city of Detroit? You have the state who's actually in the city of Detroit with its oversight function, with no money. You have the mayor and city council with no co co cohesive message to rally the people or leadership in Lansing around, no money. And you also have you potentially being the only white candidate in this race or major um, candidate in this race in a majority black city with no money. You know, I've heard the no money story my whole life. Uh, when we went into Wayne County, I was told there was no money, we were on the verge of bankruptcy. When I went into the smart bus system, it was on the verge of shutting down, I was told there was no money. When I went into the Detroit Medical Center in 2004, uh, they had already voted to close Hutzel of Receiving, and I was told there's no money. Every time I've gone into a situation where I'm told there's no money, and I get in there, I find out there's all kinds of mismanagement. There's all kinds of opportunities to improve things. And if you can bring in a talented management team and get the employees and the unions to work with you, you could turn things around a lot faster uh, than it appears. And what I would say is this. Detroit is on the verge of completely losing self-determination. 
whether it's an emergency manager, whether it's a bankruptcy judge, whether it's the city running out of cash in December, as is currently predicted, whatever it is, Detroit is always teetering on the verge of losing uh, its right of self-determination. And I believe that I'm the candidate most likely to bring that back. Every place I've been, I've executed financial turnarounds. I haven't needed oversight boards or review boards or any of that. I think that I can recruit the talent to this city, and I think the talent is in the city. I think I can recruit it to city government. Uh, and, uh, and when I look at the other potential candidates of the race, you can't point to one financial turnaround any of them did. So if you believe that Detroit's right to self-determination is important, I, you know, I feel like I have a, a strong case of my candidacy. Now, you, you're saying that you will be able to draw the right talent to assist in a, a Duggan administration, uh, the, the needs uh, or the delivering of services and tackling this, uh, this, this issue of no money. Um, but a big reason why we're seeing uh, a decline in population and residents continuously leaving the city is because of certain quality of life issues no that are just standing front and center and preventing the growth in this city. One of the major issues is crime. Right. We, you mentioned a few moments ago about the turnover in the chief of police. Crime, it, it just seems as if um, the, this administration, the Bing administration, is not tackling it in a way that is making a difference and making citizens feel safe in this city. Jonathan, the violence in Detroit is not normal. This is not happening in other urban areas in this country. And, and people in Detroit uh, need to understand how out of line this is. We're going to have 350 murders in the city this year. If we had the same murder rate as Boston, we'd only have 50. If we had the same murder rate as New York City, we'd only have 40. Uh, major cities in this country have successfully tackled their violence problem by teaming their local police department, the prosecutor, the sheriff, the, the U.S. attorney, the DEA, the ATF, in a single strategy to take guns out of the drug trade. It is the single fastest way you bring down violence in a community. It's been done in many places in this country. And at the moment, there's no concerted strategy. For a brief period of time, there was a concerted strategy under Warren Evans. Now, he may have done some things that probably went too far, but the fact was the city was on a concerted strategy when he was removed and his replacement did not carry on those policies. Now the replacement's been removed. Um, you don't uh, have the kind of crime funding you should have. But my last year as prosecutor, we had the fewest murders in this city in 30 years. We had the feds and the city and the county working together. We can get back to that. It's not as difficult as it looks. The City of Detroit Police Department is under a consent agreement. Right. Um, for, for some strange reason, they, the police department and the Bing administration hasn't been able to address in a, in a timely fashion um, the, the concerns of the federal government and the federal monitor. One, we heard that the former mayor was sleeping with the federal monitor, so they weren't talking about too much of anything, I, I would suppose. But the next mayor needs to have a plan in place to remove all of this oversight. What is your plan to, one, deal with crime, but also we have another dynamic, um, uh, Mr. Duggan. You have a board of police commissioners who will be elected now. Right. This mayor, this mayor doesn't seem to work, well, I'm talking about the current mayor, doesn't seem to work well with legislative bodies or other, uh, or, uh, other entities that he um, is pretty much mandated to work with in the, under this current charter. It's hard work in politics to work with the city council, to work with the state legislature, with people who have a different perspective than you do, but it's what I've done all my life. You know, at DMC, a huge amount of our funding comes from the state of Michigan in the form of Medicaid. When Rick Snyder and the Republican legislature got elected, a whole coalition of hospitals from the Grand Rapids area went up to Lansing saying, now's the time, and tried to siphon DMC's money off to their areas, even though they didn't have the same number of poor people. Everybody thought we were dead. We got both the Republican House, the Republican Senate, and the Republican governor to say no to them and keep the funding in place. But it was a lot of hard work. Now, when it comes to the civil rights violations, that started under the police chief, Benny Napoleon, at that point. That's when the federal monitor came in. So it's been three administrations now. The way you get rid of 
uh, the oversight is to administer competently. You make a checklist of the issues, you put somebody in charge of them, they fix them or you get rid of the people and you don't put up with it. But the sooner we get the feds out of the police department, the feds out of the water department, and the state out of our finances, the better off Detroit's future is gonna be. When we come back, we're gonna talk about Detroit's future from Mike Duggan's perspective. And what is he hearing from the citizens of Detroit? Because right now, as far as I'm concerned, many citizens have been telling me, um, both in emails and on my television and radio program, through my television and radio program, that they're frustrated with the leadership that's currently in place. So we want to hear from Mike Duggan on the other side, what would be different? Mike, a lot of people are concerned about the mayor and the council making some key decisions without really getting the, uh, getting the thoughts of the citizens at, citizenry at large. Um, this consent agreement is something that is really, really, really tearing at the hearts of residents in the city of Detroit because, as you um, stated, it, it's basically given away our ability to determine our own future. Now, from your perspective, you're, 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 you're talking about running for mayor. What are you taking from the various conversations that you're having with residents in the city? What are you taking um, from these um, conversations to, to have you to understand or cause you to understand uh, the important priorities um, that the people would like addressed? Well, I'm in somebody's living room every night of the week in different parts of the city. Uh, and it's been wonderful. It's been 25, 30 people at a time in each neighborhood. Uh, but the overwhelming concerns are three. One, I'm not safe in my home. I don't have any confidence the police will come when I call. And if you're not feeling safe, people won't want to have their business here, people won't want to live here, people won't want to visit here. So they want the violence down, they want the street lights on, and they want the abandoned house problem solved once and for all because abandoned houses are tearing down uh, the, the value people have uh, in their homes. And, and those are the overwhelming issues uh, that I'm hearing from people. You know, right now the mayor and the council were they were they were elected in the last election because of all the corruption that was going on. But we still seen some bad practices and some ethical um, questions that are still taking place um, in the current administration. Ethics has to be a priority of any new um, leadership coming into the city of Detroit because of the um, past experiences that we've, we've, we've seen in our area, both at Wayne County and, and the city of Detroit. In a Duggan administration, how is ethics viewed and how will fairness be applied when it comes to administering city, uh, city government, especially when it comes to letting of contracts? Well, let's start with this. I, I have a lot of criticisms of the big administration, but I think uh, an area where Mayor Bing has made a major contribution is restoring integrity to City Hall. I think he has moved it enormously uh, in the right direction in his term, and I would continue that. Here's the way we do it at DMC. We have 14,000 employees. You hear scandal stories all the time about Medicaid fraud and billing issues, et cetera. You don't hear those coming out of DMC. We have a very aggressive compliance program. Every employee at DMC is trained on our ethics laws. We have a hotline where any employee can make a phone call to report it, and citizens can make a phone call, and we investigate each of them. Uh, we pick a management team that's committed to ethics, and while if you make a mistake on the job, uh, we'll give you a second chance, if that mistake relates to stealing or integrity, you don't get uh, a second chance. So you have to set a tone uh, from the beginning uh, that integrity is expected as a prerequisite uh, to work for city government. There is a, a, a week ago, uh, there was a, a hearing before the Detroit City Council where you had a number of residents who appeared before uh, the council complaining about all the no-bid contracts that are being let and out of the Bing administration. Um, there, there is there's still 
um, concerns as it relates to contracting. So I wanted to know um, from your perspective, what mechanism would you put in place to ensure that there's transparency in the process when um, you're dealing with uh, contracting for city services? Well, well you, you, you have to have a very tight procurement ordinance and you need to follow it. I would guess, and I'm not familiar with these details, that if the Bing administration is doing no-bid no contracts, it's because they fell behind schedule and had to get it done as opposed to fundamental dishonesty. But that comes back to the problem. Why are we always scrambling to get stuff too late? And why do we always have announcements that no matter what happens, we're about to run out of cash again? Uh, and it means you can't have two or three people running around doing everything. You need to build a management team of 25 top administrators all across the system to turn this city around. And I think if there's one thing that I've done in my life, you know, when I went into uh, the smart bus system, I didn't know anything about buses. When I went into the Detroit Medical Center, I didn't know anything about hospitals. What I did know about was talent. And I recruited a whole lot of really talented people and turned them loose. And that's what we'll do in city government. There's a lot of talent in this city. And we're going to bring them into leadership roles here. Uh, and we're going to rebuild this place. And the turnaround's not as far away as it appears. You know, uh, we hear a lot about how um, the, the, the city services are, are, the mayor is trying to address the, the concerns as it relates to city services. Um, but a, a major concern for, um, for me and, and a lot of residents is that we don't, he, we don't feel as if the community is part of the planning stage, right. the development stage right. of uh, in the development stage when many of these plans are put, are, are, are put, uh, put forward. Um, what is your perspective as far as community and its involvement and its relationship uh, between yourself and, 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 and city government? Well, at some point in the next couple of months, we'll put out our, our plan for the neighborhoods and you'll see exactly that question. Uh, but we're going to go on the approach that every neighborhood should have a future. This idea that you could have lived in a house for 20 or 30 years and we're going to turn your street lights off and stop fixing your roads and tell you to move, to me is immoral. But the way you have every neighborhood has a future is the neighborhoods have to be involved in designing that future. Uh, and you've got people like those in the Warren Connor group that are actively involved. Uh, but I've talked to a lot of block club presidents, community groups, who feel that city government doesn't have any interest in what they have to say. We're going to set up a process that says every neighborhood has a future, that neighborhoods are going to have a say in what that future is, and we're going to end up with a master plan uh, that is going to rebuild this city. And urban farming may be a good solution for one area. It's not going to be a solution for another area. Getting some shopping in might be a good solution for one area, won't be for another area. But if we allow the local neighborhoods realistically to drive that, uh, we could end up with a plan that everybody believes in. Well, Mike, I want to thank you for coming on the show, and we're going to have um, some future conversations with you as well as other individuals who saying they want to lead the city of Detroit. I know of no safe repository of the ultimate power of society but the people, and if we think them not enlightened enough, the remedy is not to take power from them but to inform them by education. That's what I hope we do here each week, educate you and inform you on all of these issues that affect us around here. Until next week, have a great week.